Welcome to SelfDiscoveryMedia.com, where we discover the communities that are making a difference in the lives of others. Our self-discovery is something we are all making on our life's journey. Here you will find the people that will be your guidance, that will be your inspiration, that will be there for you in support on your journey of life. Do enjoy. Our next show is... Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to The Story Matters, right here on selfdiscoverymedia.com. I am your host, Sarah Troy, and my guest today is Lee Habib. What a beautiful tale he is telling us today. The streets were my father. And for so many, the streets are the parents of our children, and it shouldn't be so. You know, it's different to when the kids went out and played ball until the sun came down, until mom shouted it's dinner. Those were the friendly streets, but streets aren't so friendly anymore. They're filled with people that are gangs waiting to pick on the prey, waiting to pick on the people that are fatherless, the parents that are struggling, those that feel alone, those that don't feel heard. He says the streets were my father, a story of hopelessness and redemption. He's the executive producer of the movie. It's All Our American Stories uh, film production. He's the CEO of the host of Our American Stories, a national syndicate nonprofit storytelling show heard here on 330 stations across the country. He's also a weekly Newsweek um, essayist. The film features the stories of three inner city Chicago men, one African American, and two Hispanics, and their journey from fatherless to gangs, from prison to encounters with prison ministry programs that set them on the road to redemption, a life as productive as members of society. Faith is one solution. Christians have been at the forefront of prison reform in America and soul reform too, of healing men and women and guiding their lives where, when they exist, uh, exit to the the prison world. In a world lacking in love, believers and non-believers alike will be moved by the stories of these three men. These do not, um, these are not love stories, but stories about redemption, transformation and transcendence. And when you look at the statistics, folks, we've really got to wake up. You know, we can't walk around with our blinkers all the time and say, it doesn't affect me because it does. These are the facts about growing up without a father. 90% of the homeless and runaway Nine, that's 90 percent, 90 percent, 38 times percent, the average 70 uh, average, 71 percent of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes, uh, nine times the average, 85 percent of children with behavior disorders, that's 20 times the average, 70 percent of Americans believe uh, fatherless homes is the biggest social problem. I'm going to add another statistic in there that 70% um, of those incarcerated also come from foster homes and they go from one home to the other and the system isn't working, is it Lee? You know, we, we have to change it and we, we know that government and, and those organizations are very, very slow to change. So we have to be that change. We have to bring that change. And we can't do it with damnation. We have to do it with love because love is really where we want them to get to, isn't it? Self-love, love of life, love of a meaningful purpose. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. A big topic. Now, I'm going to ask you, did you grow up with your father by your side? You know, luckily for me, I I grew up with a very present and a very uh, deliberate father who whose whose own father wasn't really there in any real respect. I mean, he was there but not there. And mm -hmm. my dad wanted to do something different. He became a teacher, a coach. He was home every night, played ball. Uh, not a perfect father, of course, but there were father son struggles. But my dad did something interesting with us. He was always having us volunteer with kids who didn't have fathers, mm. very wise father, because yeah. it's only in the absence of something yes. that we can, can truly appreciate our lives. I love taking kids on mission trips to Haiti. When they come back to the United States, their criticism level drops. <laughs> yes. They see what we have. Mm. And they don't take for granted free speech rights and ready food and, and, and internet. Running water. They they <laughs> they're different human beings after two weeks in Haiti. Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, it's always uh, the grass is always greener on the other side until you get to the other side. <laughs> right? Right. And then, OK, this is a desert, <laughs> you know, um, 
and, and I think there's a lot to do with, with media and social media and, and everything else that pushes the discord. You know, uh, something to moan about, something to feel disgruntled about. It is not an advocate of gratitude, of even what little you have, as long as you have each other, you have a lot. And it's so true. And, and the hopelessness cuts two ways, I've learned. There's a hopelessness in these boys growing up in certain zip codes. And this is not just an African-American problem. No. Go to hollows around the country. Go to Appalachia. You'll see this with white families. You'll see this with Hispanic families. Fatherlessness rates have the, the, the level at which they're at now compared to the Great Depression. I mean, everybody was poor during the Great Depression. Yeah. Everybody was poor. But the idea that my Italian grandparents, who had nothing, my Lebanese grandparents, who had even less, would ever father a kid and leave it was simply unimaginable. Yeah. They would have been run out of the family. They would have been shamed. Mm -hmm. There were no welfare benefits for those right. women anyway, right? And so sometimes when we try to do good as a government and we put in policies, and there are a lot of good government policies, yeah. But many of us are scratching our heads wondering why fatherlessness exploded after the 1960s. It exploded. Now, there were other factors, economic factors, mm -hmm. displacement, there's structural racism. But what explains the white out of wedlock birth rate exploding by almost 10x since the Great Depression? right? 10x. It's 8x for African Americans. And these the Latino communities, they started really coming to this country. It's exploded there too. It's almost 50% of Latino kids grow up without a present father in the home. This is a crisis for all of us. Now, you know, it's patterns need to be broken, right? And, and we see this, we see people who have been abused end up abusing their children. And the last thing they thought they would ever do would abuse their own, but it's the pattern they know. And unless we break that pattern right when they're young, unless we say to them, though, no, that is an old pattern, it's not serving you. This is the pattern that I want you to go to and it is of love, kindness, consideration, compassion, being there for one another. They have broken that pattern, but we see it time and time again, just a repeat and a repeat and a repeat. And then they go, how did I get here? Mm -hmm. I hated my father doing it to me. I hated everyone else doing it to me. Why am I doing it to myself? And that is such a scenario that we see over and over again. Well, each of these three men go through that trap. Mm -hmm. They have either no fathers or the kind of father they wish they didn't have a father. Mm -hmm. And one of them, their father's killed in a gang. Um, and, and, and he's killed when he's 15. And this father uh, never let his son smile in a photograph because he said, never project weakness. So imagine a father who both was abusive to the mother, abusive to the son, physically and verbally, and then never let him smile in front of a camera or anywhere else, because it would project weakness. And he never understood why his father projected this strength until he found out what his dad really did for a living when his father was murdered. And of course, the son's response to that was, I'm going to seek revenge. I'm going to join a gang, right? Because yeah. that's the logical thing to do. Well, all three of these men hit this point where they go, I want to be someone different. I don't want to do this anymore. And here's where the other side of the hopelessness comes in. If all of us who have fathers or have good families think that there's nothing we can do to help, well, that's a kind of fatalism. Yeah. That's really sad and tragic too. And this story is really about one man, Manny Mill, and his ministry coming in and not only saving these three men, but dozens and dozens and dozens of others. And simply by getting to know them, visiting them in prison, putting a heart on them, putting love on them, meeting them at the gate when they come out of prison, having a job ready for them, having them trained for the skills while they're in prison, trained for the habits of life while they're in prison. And here's the most important point, having some people, some bodies on them, a new gang, a new gang of people who want what's best for this man. Yeah. And there aren't women in this film. Our next film next year is going to be the impact of fatherlessness on women and some of the great ministry programs. And, you know, we've looked for great secular programs mm -hmm. and there are a few, but the overwhelming and you'll get atheist social scientists to admit this. The data's in these faith based programs are the difference maker in our prisons, federal, state, ask any warden in America and they'll say those suburbanites coming in of all races and creeds on a Sunday to pray with these men is an act of love and mercy that's so overwhelming that in the beginning, the inmates are like, what do they want with us? What's mm -hmm. their, you know, what's their angle? And then when they learn <laughs> later, there is no angle. It's mm -hmm. a thing called love. 
and they, they get to experience this unconditional love from a stranger. This is overwhelming and overpowering. And it's something we're all capable of doing, mm -hmm. especially any of us who go to church weekly. We don't have to go to that church every week. We can do church inside a prison. It's yes. allowed and it's safe and it's beautiful. You know, I've, I always say that a, a closed heart can't let the divine in. <laughs> and whatever your faith is, exactly. right? God can't come through a closed heart because that's the way God speaks to us, ignites our heart into compassion and believing and knowing and, and understanding and you know lifts our spirit into action and our mind will know what it needs to know when it needs to know it. But for so many of these people, they've either never opened their heart or have closed their heart down out of protection because if they don't feel they're tough and they don't have to face anything and I'm all right, Jack. But the moment you start breaking that down and squeezing that heart open, yes, it's painful. That's where the redemption comes through. You have to face everything that you've done. You have to face everything that you felt. But the only way through it is to go through it. And when you've got a loving atmosphere and loving people around you, you say, it's okay. You don't need to persecute yourself anymore. This is about recovery. This is about... Yes, you know, taking responsibility for what you've done, but understanding why you've done it and why the page needs to be changed. If that love isn't the force behind it, where is the incentive? And if you can't open up that heart, then how can you help people? You've got to get to the heart. <laughs> it's so true. And you said some important things there. And one of them is that that love is there, but the accountability has to be there. They yes. have to take not only responsibility for what they do, but every single one of these characters seeks not only forgiveness from their God, because their God gave it, but what they also want to do and feel compelled to do is to go to the people of the families they harmed and say, I'm sorry. Yes. And this is big. So they're no longer claiming their innocence. As Carlos Colon said, I was fighting for my innocence, but I did it. Right. I did it. I killed the guy who killed my friend. Mm -hmm. I did it. And there's no excuse for it. And I want to meet the father of the son I killed. And I want to say, I'm sorry. By the way, we filmed that scene in the movie and it is, it is so powerful because the father forgives him. He accepts the forgiveness because as a father, he himself was in prison and his son ran the streets. Right. So he knew that in the end, he had been forgiven. He had become a Christian and he had to forgive Carlos. And, and then he said at the end in this beautiful scene where these men come together, he hugs him and he says, I accept your apology. I've been praying for you for 20 years. I love you and you're my son now. Yeah. You can't not weep at no. something so beautiful. And you see, but that was the willingness to open the heart. Yep. You know, you, before you ask forgiveness for anyone else, you must find that forgiveness within yourself. That's right. Right. And um, yeah. I've interviewed a number of people where things have happened to them. Well, you know, one of them, a pastor, uh, his pregnant wife and two children in the car and a 17 year old drunk driver killed his wife, baby and two children. And he said, how can I stand up there and preach love and forgiveness if I'm not willing to forgive? Now, obviously, he had to go through the mourning and the grieving, but he ended up turning around to that child and helping that young man who was 17 at the time change his life around altogether. And, you know, that courage that strength, you've taken four of my members away from me, right? But I am willing to forgive. I'm willing to help you change your life. Isn't it the courage that we all hope we could find within ourselves? Well, I, I think that's true. And that's why we, we wanted to tell this story on, on so many different levels. It's impacting lots of people. Um, we've already gotten correspondence. I got a, a correspondence from someone I've known quite a while. And his father was really tough on him. And his father was always telling his son he was a bum, that he would never amount to anything. Because his father wanted to be working with his hands. And his son wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And his son became a very successful lawyer, but at a price. He never really was good at relationships. He wanted to prove his father wrong. And so he created a prison for himself. And as he told me only a couple of weeks ago, I watched the film. I cried like, well, like I've never cried before. I'm not different than those guys. Right. I suffered from my father. I created a life of success, but it was all trappings. I have no relationships with anybody. I've lost two wives to divorce. My kids don't like me and I have got to change my life. And, and so that's, you know, you don't have to be in prison no. to 
created an emotional prison for yourself. Well, I mean, as you said, that there's the prison with the bars and there's the prison, you know, with the heart shut down. And and That's if right. you, I mean, you know, this is called self-discovery, you know, this, uh, yeah. this website and, you know, and it, and it is about that self-discovery. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. You know, we're all looking for a tribe. We're all looking for somewhere to belong. We're all looking for somewhere to be loved. But before we kind of come and join the orchestra, we've got to learn how to play our own instrument. Mm -hmm. And that instrument, you know, comes from the heart, that connection to that instrument, because each and every one of us is gifted something that we are meant to bring to the collective, that we are meant to share with society. And that we've got to be willing to take that discovery. And that means you're going to have to face some things that you did and that you are, that you don't like about yourself, but it's not about the persecution, is it? No. No, you know, in fact, you know, growth involves pain. Yes. When was the last time you learned something, really yeah. learned something yeah. that didn't involve some pain and some suffering. <laughs> right. Um, it's a part of life. And in yeah. fact, if you want to blame some other, someone else or some system mm. or some whatever for your ailments, uh, as my mom used to say, and I grew up Lebanese in an all white town, and it was 20,000 people. And the first week or two we were there, there were about a dozen boys who were really mean to me and my mm. sister. I came home and I started complaining to my parents, both of whom have lost family members in World War II. And they said, get to know those boys. We're not going to the principal's office because right. you got called a name. Moreover, my mom said something deep. If you start to look for racism with all the white kids, because only a few did that, yeah. and you were projected on all those white kids, the very things that those few white kids were projecting onto you, you will have become the racist. Yes. And I will not permit that in my household. The white Twice. people in the town have treated us beautifully, overwhelmingly. There are a couple that may not know Arab kids. They may have troubles of their own. Get to know those boys. And we did. And two of the three are some of my best friends mm -hmm. all the way through my life. And all because I said, hey, let's grab lunch. Yeah, get out of here. No, look, come on, just a quick lunch. Hey, let me buy you lunch. Right. And then everything changes. And now we have a grievance community where one thing gets said, somebody gets offended. They go and say this. They cancel this person. That person cancels this one. This is your fault. Republicans fault, Democrat fault, black, white, gay, straight. And I just go, look in a mirror. Yes. Look at a mirror and improve your life. And if you don't, you'll be angry at the world. And people who are angry at the world are angry at the world their whole life. And it doesn't end well. And you get to choose which in life and what kind of life you want to live. And that's the real reason we did this movie. These three guys finally said, I'm no longer mad at my father and mother. I've forgiven them. And now I have relationships with them. More importantly, I'm a father now. Right. I've broken two, three, and four generation cycles of fatherlessness. What a thing to be proud of as Very. a man and a woman. My and, you know, no, it, no, it's not easy. But, you know, I, I kind of put it to, um, to birthing. You know, we carry a baby for nine months. And I know you guys don't relate, but I can tell you there's morning sickness, there's backache, you know, there's numerous things that you're doing, but you're carrying a life and that life is a wonderment, right? Then you've got to go through the hours and hours of pain of giving birth. And there's, you know, there's still a lot of um, afterbirth discomfort and everything that you've got to go through, but this life you're holding in your hands is just absolutely wondrous. Why can't we go through the process of rebirthing ourselves and hold ourselves in that new light and where we're able to see things from a different point of view, where we're coming from a place of love, self-love and blank slate of wonderment of what can I bring to this world in the ray of light? Indeed, and that's what this film will show you. These are three men who, in their gang functions and features and how they live their life, if you had bumped into them on a the street, you would have been wise to avoid them because they were yes. looking for trouble. As, one, as Carlos Colon said, we were trying to disrupt the world because we were disrupted. Yeah. We were going to, as, as another guy said, hurt boys, hurt boys. Yes. Oh, and, and these are yeah. very powerful lines and they knew yeah. it and they, they didn't know why they were hurting. Like they, they couldn't mm. tag it back to their father. In fact, one of the guys said, you know, once you're in a gang, you inherit all the beefs of a gang and you end up hating people and you don't even know why. But it all <laughs> goes back to no fathers because all the gang members have no fathers. So right. they all have this open wound and they yeah. go and they take it out on each other. They, and white take it out on white gangs, mm. blacks take it out on black gangs. And then they take it out on each other. Yeah, this, yeah. Look, this is the human story, right? From time yes. immemorial. Yes. This is the human story. 
Yeah. So how do we rise above it? And how do we yeah. find the divine? As you said before, how do we define, how do we find and then define the divine within us? This is, this is what life can and should be all about. Yeah. You know, the other thing I think that's a very, very big thing that we need to do is when we look at people who have been in gangs, maybe have killed, um, and they're now, you know, either out in society or they're making amends or they've stepped up, you know, into their divine presence, we've got to stop persecuting them. They've taken their journey. Um, I had another gentleman that was in a gang in England, and but at the age of seven, he was Irish. He literally saw a young man he was hiding under the bushes as the shooting was happening and this young man got shot and he's dying before him and he can't do anything for him and the young man is calling for his mother and he himself had been given up by his mother never knew his father and so you know tossed from one home to the other ended up in a gang ended up as england's most wanted ended up in jail you know now leading a life of motivation and uh, how to avoid that how to come out of that I don't believe we go through anything without learning from it and passing that lesson on of, of solution. And the best teachers are those that have gone through it. Because when a gang member speaks to another gang member, I hear you, I was one of you, but look at me now. It gives that hope. It gives that belief there is something more than just this. Well, you're seeing in America, and it's been something that I've, I've been so proud to witness, the, the amount of and nature of the prison reform and the leader of this, by, and this is going to sound a little strange to your audience, but the state that led this first in America was a state called Texas, mm -hmm. a, a state that used to kill a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They used to kill 30, 40 people a year. Last year, it was down at two. And there's a huge movement to have it be zero. But moreover, they've closed a lot of prisons. They've, they've, they've created a nurturing environment. Lots of churches and even secular folks have gotten in on this because they realize, my goodness, these are human lives. They yes. do have the story. So how do we get them to integrate into society? Moreover, we can't just do prison reform because if you simply lower a sentence and then you send the guy back to yeah. the same streets, he's just coming back and he'll do more, he'll do more crimes with fewer sentences than less crimes with a lot, but here's what's happened in Texas. They've closed several state prisons over the past decade and their crime rate has gone down. Imagine that. And by the way, this is what I hate about the media. They don't want to tell the good news. No. They don't Fear want to tell sales. The Fear sales. It's a form of control. It is right? a form of control to keep us bitter, to yeah. keep us arguing for ratings. Yeah. For ratings. Yeah. I know. Sell soap. I know. I mean, you know, there's criminals everywhere, aren't there? <laughs> it's not just look, the gangs. There are some people who need to go away for a very long time. Yeah. We need to, and they, they're still in, 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 in need of redemption. In fact, Leslie Williams, one of the main characters in our story, was saved in the end, not by proselytizing, but there was a man that, that, who, whose nickname was Peanut because he was so big, but he was so big and so feared for so long until he wasn't suddenly peanut got saved and peanut became this role model for all these guys yeah and peanut who had a life sentence with no chance of parole was always smiling and he said why is he smiling he had and, and then he found out why peanut had purpose yes and he had the divine spark and yes. even inside prison peanut knew what his divine calling was and that was to get to the hearts of these young men and he did, and to countless. He's a legend mm. in the jail that he ultimately lost his life in and let, you know, died in. But he spent a, a several decades ministering as a death row inmate uh, to many, many uh, young men. And he was the kind of person who said, I need to do this time. What I did was really, really bad. Right. So but you know. We own it. But that's the point, you know, whether we're in jail or not in jail, we've got to own it. You know, we also got to realize, why did I do that? Right. You know, where, what kind of thinking made me do that? Because the core of me would never do that if I was engaged. So, you know, what is the hate of me? Or, you know, I have to prove something to someone. And you cannot be a gangster and go around killing each other or selling drugs to people and having kids overdose if your heart is open. That's right. 
Really, you can't, it's actually really, really almost impossible to do these things. It, it, because you can't knowingly hurt someone if you are in a state of love, if that heart is open, if that purpose is open. There are many people that going to jail was their life lesson when where they really became and then came out to make a difference to others. Or in the case of Peanut and a couple of others that I've done shows on are still there and they're, they're no longer bitter and they go, okay, I am having a bigger impact here in jail with my recovery, with me owning what I did wrong, with, with me stepping into that light than I am out there. And yep. they and they accept that, you know, and it's like it goes back to the word purpose. Every single one of us needs a meaningful purpose. That's our instrument that we bring to the orchestra of life. We need that purpose. Otherwise, we're flapping in the wind and we're lost souls and we don't know what to do with ourselves. And that's when the little devils come up and go, mm, I can gobble up this one. I'll give them a purpose. You know, I love going into campuses and you know, someone will describe me as this or that, and it's never, it's, it's always a bucket they're trying to put you in. Yes. And then I start with a simple question. I, I said, I'm gonna look, I'm going to do a poll of the 300 of you. And I'm going to start with one question with your eyes open. And I want all the rest of the uh, questions answered with your eyes closed and the room dark. So you can't see each other and you can't weigh the answers or the peer pressure from each right. other. First question, how many of you think the nation's more divided than ever before? And almost every hand went up. Mm -hmm. Then I said, let's close our eyes. I said, how many of you believe in a divine force or a divinity of some kind, God of some kind, shape or form? Almost every hand went up. Mm -hmm. And then I asked, how many of you believe in love? Almost every hand stayed up. I asked them if they believed in marriage, if they found the right person, almost every hand stayed up. Kids, if they found that person, almost every hand stayed up. And then it got interesting. I said, how many of you, if you had a daughter, would want that girl to meet a boy who got her pregnant and left? Not a hand went up. Right. Said, How many of you would want to have a son who got a girl pregnant and left? Not a hand went up. And then I, I, I raised up the, 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 the display and showed them that there was about 99% unanimity on some of the biggest existential questions you could ever ask. And then I asked them why to each of them, particularly uh, the, the idea of why don't you want your daughter to meet a guy who gets her pregnant and leave? Because mm. that's a trauma. Right. And yes. they all know it. Now, that's not judging anybody because it no, it's a fact. Yet. It hasn't even happened yet. Yes. And all I do when I leave is I say, be the men and women who you said you hoped you'd be. Yeah. And it's never too late. You know, I know I know for a lot of them when, you know, as they're coming out through that consciousness, you know, and and owning what they've done, you know, that the overwhelming guilt consumes them and like, you know, the, the pain that they've opened up to of why did I do that, the pain of I've caused and all of that. But if you're willing to keep moving through it, keep moving through it, you will get to that side of love and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And you will get to that side of finding that meaningful purpose. It, life isn't about we have to suffer, but we do suffer because that's the human condition we impose upon ourselves. You know, heaven and hell. Well, heaven can be here on earth and hell most certainly can be here on earth. Mm -hmm. It's all a matter of choice. <laughs> it, it is indeed. And, you know, there's a great John Stuart Mill essay and Mill was really perplexed with chasing happiness, but it was actually pleasure he was chasing. When you mm -hmm. chase pleasure, you'll never get to happiness. No. Um, and, and what he discovered in his non-ending and unending research was the people who were the happiest were people who served others and mm -hmm. had gotten on with some of the major pain and challenges mm -hmm. of their life. And so even if you get over the hump and you do do this, what is your purpose? Yeah. And are you serving other people? Because you're continually taking your own temperature to see if you're happy. Your self-happiness is hard without, a bit, a bit, in some sense, knowing who you are, but then serving others. Yeah. That's where joy comes. Yes. And, and by the way, this is what I sort of love about freedom in the end. I mean, I was talking to a young person about free markets and free enterprise. And I said, can you imagine what the local restaurant would look like if there was only one and it was run by the government? Oh, actually, we know it's the high school cafeteria. <laughs> it's horrible. Yes. So think about yes. what that restaurant owner has to do. He has to serve his customers and yes. he has to serve them with love and he has to get the price right and he has to do these things right. And if he gets it wrong, if he doesn't serve, if he serves himself, 
doesn't take care of his people, then they will leave and they not only have every right to leave, but it's a good and redeeming feature of life that you're held accountable from the bottom up and not the top down. And, uh, and so this is true of life too. In the end, if your customers are leaving your restaurant, you best start looking at what's going wrong. Don't blame the customers. Oh God, no! I'm 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 from the restaurant business. My son owns a restaurant, and you know during this whole COVID time, and you know when when the lockdown went down last year, he just broken snapped his Achilles, and he's in a plaster cast, and the news comes, and there he is at the cashier's just taking orders for takeout, and yet not knowing what the hell is coming, how long it's going to be, and he's navigated very well and managed to maintain most of his staff by pivoting because his staff are his family. That's right. Right. And that, and people come because this is their place, like cheers, right? They come, this is their place. And as long as they leave with a happy tummy and a smile on their face, he feels he's served. And he has done something really beautiful and important. He's created something out of nothing. He's created something that's important for people to gather around. Eating is one of the most important things we do every day. Yes. With whom we do it, what we eat, how long we take to eat is the of so much of life. And so your son has chosen a, a, a not only a difficult profession, but a beautiful profession. And it's a profession and he's a professional, yeah. right? And he's a servant. And it's a beautiful thing that allows him to invest his own time and capital and, and then to see what happens and to pivot and to learn. And then that, that pivot is pain, but it's also growth and it's excitement. And a lot of people were able to pivot during COVID and some were yeah. not. No. And that's resilience, right? Yes. And what is resilience and how do we work on resilience in a culture? Um, and again, it, it, kids who have good and loving families have more of an ability to withstand suffering, be able to withstand a, 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 a something coming from the side. Yeah. They also have support systems, mm-hmm. uh, people who have a little bit of capital around them if they need a little bit. So the idea that we can get this overnight, the idea that you can mm-hmm. grow these things called resilient families and resilient businesses without a lot of work without quite a bit of pain and a lot of joy too. The idea that you can do this in a mixer or in a microwave is I think one of the big problems. People want this stuff fast and it doesn't come fast. It comes one day at a time, it comes. If you're willing to take the journey, if you're willing to take the journey. You know, my son actually did have a crossroads. Um, You know, um, he and uh, his father and I are divorced and it was a very dysfunctional marriage, you know, you know, kind of like, how the hell did you two get together in the first place? (laughs) And it was two broken people trying to fix each other and it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know his father loves him, but he's coming from a kind of, you know, a lot of children in the family and kind of neglect or trying to prove himself and everything. And he's just not being able to be there. And there's a lot of things that are coming out of my son right now from memories when he's young you know, of the angry father. And at one point he started going down a road that I, I didn't like and I didn't like who he became. And I actually said to him, I love you to death and I always will, but I don't like who you are and I can't be around you. And at one point he came to this crossroads. I know if I go down that road, I probably won't survive. Can I do that to my mother? Mm-hmm. And he decided to change roads. And now he's the successful, not only restaurateur, but a community man. Wherever he goes, everybody in the community knows him. He made the choice to place value upon himself, to go through the struggle and do something else. We're all, we all at some point come to that crossroads. No doubt. And, it, and we've got and to pause. Maybe and oh, maybe yeah. several times. Yes, yes. And the thing is, don't rush to go through it. You know, don't react. You know, we, we want you to just, that whole thing about deep breath, take a deep breath, center your entire chakras, center your body, let your core come out because your core can't lie. It is the ultimate truth. Listen to your core and which direction you need to take and where can you be of best service. But I find so many people are rushing into something because they're seeking. I just need to belong. I need to be approved of. I need to be validated. I need to be loved. And somebody you know, plays the Pied Piper and, oh, you're my bestie. And the next thing you know, they're in a path that is like, hey, this wasn't the path that I wanted to go on, but how do I hell do I get out of it now? Well, you know what helps, though? Having, having these 
practices, and, and many of them are faith-based practices, from the meditation and the mm -hmm. Eastern religions to prayer, which is, what's yes. the difference, right? There's yes, very so difference. it's all divine energy. It's all divine stuff. Yes, and, yes. And, and it's silence, right? And it's yes. stillness. Yes. And it's asking the big questions between you and your maker. Mm -hmm. not, what did someone else do? You know, I'm not here to talk about, if, if I'm talking about my wife to God, God's not listening. He doesn't want to hear my opinion about my wife. He wants yeah. to know what I contributed to right. my rough part of my marriage. What did mm -hmm. I do wrong? Mm -hmm. And what am I going to do about it? Yes. Um, and, and so, you know, good prayer, good meditation um, is, is serious business. Um, it is. And it's good business. It is. Yes, because, you know, as I've said, and I'm a very a huge woman of, of spirit, of faith, um, even if it doesn't maybe fall under a particular umbrella, you know, a, a closed heart cannot listen to the divine message. And you are never, ever, ever alone. And if you are still enough with an open heart and just simply ask, what do I need to know? What do I need to see? The answer will always be there. But you've also then got to open up your eyes because the answer will never come in a little package or wrapped up parcel. It's going to come in bizarre ways. So now you've got to step out in allowing allowing yourself to take that journey. Okay, you're going to fall down? Yeah, get back up. You know you've got the strength. You know you've got the resilience. You know you've got the tenacity. Get back up. Keep walking forward. Hit a dead end. Doesn't matter. What did you learn on that street? Turn around. Take what you know. Walk down another street. But be willing to allow yourself to move forward with the divine presence and love. It will never see you wrong. No doubt. Couldn't agree. I, it, it's... And again, if you don't have the family that taught you these things, right. how do you learn them? And from you learn it the hard way, the hard <laughs> by your own self-discovery, right? <laughs> um, you know, because, you know, whether, whether we're talking about people in jail and, and kudos to them for being willing to share that journey, because it's not easy for someone to say, I did this. And, uh, you know, and now this is where I am. And, you know, it's often referred to in TV shows. Oh, they found God. You know, it's an excuse. No, it isn't. <laughs> you know, it's whether they found Christianity or whatever they found, they found themselves. They found the God within them. Yes. Right. And it's what do they do with it now that counts, right? Because whether they're still in jail or whether they come out of jail, um, it is what do you do now? What's your next chapter? How, what, what are you going to be kind of person who doesn't listen to that, who has a cynical attitude towards a person who's done that? Oh, God, then yes. You're just thinking about your own spark of divinity. Yeah. Uh, because it's missing. Because if yeah. you can't see it in others, you can't yes. see someone change their life, and you're not rooting for them to change their life for the better, and you're not happy when they do, if you're going, hmm, I wonder if that's fake. And then the second they fall on any behavioral level, see, they'll limit, and they get called hypocrites. Uh, yeah. Hypocrisy yeah. is the charge of people with no standards and no divinity in them because right. they're waiting for the human being to uh, who has divinity to not be worthy of it for a minute. That's every right. one of us will do things unbecoming a child of God or the divine. But that doesn't mean we're hypocrites. It just meant we fell short that day. Um, the person sitting around with no standards can sit around in the gallery and simply attack the cynic, can attack all of us who are playing in the spirit and space of the divine and call us phonies and frauds when we don't live up to our divine, our divine spark. But that's called the guilt of being human. Um, we will all, in the end, you know, this is why we read Shakespeare, right? Um, because in the end, we're all victims of forces that we have to keep at bay. And that's why we go to prayer. That's why we go to meditation regularly, because it can be easy to backtrack. It's yeah. not hard to go back to bad decision making. All of us can fall prey to this, especially during hard times. Right. So what do we do and how do we stay true to our divine spark? That is a daily and minute by minute, it's minute by minute work and it's good work. It's not tiresome, it's not negative. It's the only work worth worth doing to have a good and, and fulfilling life. Mm. I say inspiration begets invitation because when somebody inspires you, it invites you to want to do the same. But in my own um, counseling practice, I used to refer to the ruler. And I know it's, you know, metric and centimeters now, but you know, I'm going with inches here. And I would say that the six to the 12th um, uh, inch were people on a, a level of positivity. They've stepped into their light. They've stepped into their meaningful purpose. And then you have that four and five that are in that self-discovery, wanting to go to that light 
light, but still like a child learning to walk, wobbling on their legs, but gaining that positive energy. And then you have the one to three piranhas. They have no intentions of ever doing the work. And they go to the four and five and go, <laughs> I'm going to suck the life right out of you. And just, and you wonder, but people were doing so well. What happened? It's the people you're around. It is, whether it's family or whether it's saying you need to be around people that have got your back. They're going to encourage you to get back up. That uh, when you're on your negative times, when you feel that you can't do it anymore, I believe in you. Don't worry, you're just having a bad day, but you've got to stay away from the piranhas because they will suck the life out of you. And you oh, can't help them you. until they're willing to help themselves, you right? You can love them, but that doesn't yes. mean you have to be around them much. No, no. <laughs> and, you know, and, and this is so much to you, but they're my family. Uh-uh. Family or not, they're still in their dysfunction. But if you step into your light and you become that beacon of light and hope for other people, they're going to look at it and go, gosh, you know, what did they do? Maybe I'm willing to take that journey myself, but you can't help anyone until they're willing to step up and take their own journey. No doubt. No doubt. I love the fact that this is, you know, like not only helping people in jail, um, but the fact that this, the, this ministry is helping people come out because we see so many times they're given a few bucks, you're left out there, you're flapping in the wind. Where do you go? You're not the same person you went in. You're a different person now, but where do you belong in society? It's like, you know, just throwing a newborn baby out there and hoping that someone will catch it and teach it. And we know, again, the piranhas are going to be around there. So having, you know, no, I've got you. You're out of the gates. We're going to get you a job. We're going to help you immerse back into society. You're going to become part of that village that helps one another. If that's where we need to be. We need to be it before they commit the crime. We need to be it after they've committed the crime. But if we're not that strong village where everybody is in support of one another, then we're going to crumble again. Yeah, there indeed. And that, you know, one of the reasons I, we did the movie is that, you know, there's tens of thousands of churches and synagogues and mosques around the country. There are people who worship in their own ways. Yes. And, group. and so we ask all these people, however they worship, that, that if they want to be that divine spark for another person, yeah. put a body on them. We know yeah. in our neighborhoods, we know that we could go to the principal and say, what boys or girls are acting up a lot? Well, we know why they're acting up. We almost know dispositively why they're acting up. And so how do we put a body on them before they go to prison? Right. And even once they're in prison, how do we visit them? You know, 700,000 people a year will come out of prison. That means that if every church in America, synagogue and mosque, took in the three or four, and the average yeah. church in America is about 800 to 1,000 people. So this is not a big lift no. to bring yeah. two or three people in. And then everybody sort of spread the responsibility around and put a bunch of bodies. And, and, and now this is a new village, and it's a new part of town. Right, I yes. Because right? that's the biggest part. Leslie yeah. Williams, one of our guys, who when he finally gets out, he goes, I couldn't go back to the old neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It would have pulled me back in. Right. And that, you know, got me in the suburbs. Now, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have wanted to be in the suburbs because right. there were no gangs in the suburbs. Yeah. And there's no action in the suburbs. I don't want action. Yeah. I don't want gangs. I want to be around families. Yeah. I want to be about people who, who are functional or at least more functional than the place I was from because there's no such thing as perfect. No. <laughs> sort of we're all a work in process. <laughs> we're all a work in process. But there's a lot, as he put it, there's so much more love on the streets where I am now. Mm. And there were not because there was almost no love yeah. on the streets I was on where I grew up. There were more piranhas, gang members, yeah. were killing the spirit of the street, making the moms stay indoors, making the kids be afraid to even walk to school. Right. Is, and by the way, you go to Sub-Saharan Africa, you go to Haiti, you go to half the places in the world. This is how people live every day. They're afraid of the police, all right? Yeah. The police are rapists, they're the gangsters. Yes. They'll kill you. They'll, so, so we're very lucky in America but yet we have zip codes all over this country and then pockets of this even inside our own towns. And we can do something about it. We're the answer to this. Governments, look, we, we know one thing, we need government, but government can't love and raise a child. No. This is just a fact. It's not a yeah. condemnation of government. It's not the function of government to love and raise a child. It can't do it. Human beings need to do that and positive. Right. The people. village, the village, everyone coming together, you know, and yeah. you know, on, on the thing of religion, um, as you said, it doesn't matter what, what religion the person is. You're not spouting one religion. It's the religions of faith that step up. But if there are anyone out there that it's, you know, it's conditional, not unconditional, 
or that you, you know, you have to do this. They've already done the repenting. This yeah. is about the healing. This is about you showing them love. They do not need any more damnation. And if your religion is about that, then I question your religion because it's not based in God's love. God's yeah. love is about forgiveness and being there for one another. So, you know, it's, it's really important. Not, I think, again, as you said, growing up the people you're around because that will, you know, I mean, we grew up suburbia, you know, nobody would ever thought to some of the choices that are being made, but um, it's everywhere. You know, people think it's just poor kids that are going to, that are going to get picked up on this. No, you, no. you have a, you have a lot of wall street gangsters folks. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> and they can be more vicious, a hell of a lot more <laughs> vicious and do a lot more harm, but they're, they're hiding around the charisma and the suit and the power. No doubt. Right? So, no it is up to each and every one of us and and you know I, I firmly do believe that when people share their stories that is the inspiration you know you've been through this you found your strength you found your courage you found the resilience to keep moving forward in belief of love and purpose this is what you're doing to, today to help others you know how can it not be an inspiration how can it not be an invitation for me to look in and go well what am i doing how can i step up and help even if it's just helping myself through this recovery because when you do you have to get out and share <laughs> right? and you'll want to share too right? yes share. well then you understand that's what it's all about yeah. and then once you share you're going to see the impact you have on another simply by sharing yeah. and then you're going to want to do more of it and then you're going to encourage them to share as on their walk and not when they're finished no. share along the journey share along the journey because your sharing will move someone who's a little bit behind you in the journey. Yeah. Um, and the journey never stops anyway. So anyone who says they're done with the journey, I just start to chuckle. And you're right about the condemnation. I don't care what faith you are. You know, there's a great scene in the Bible where, you know, some Christians who are condemnation Christians will say, yeah, do you remember when Jesus says around the prostitute, um, he who hasn't sinned cast the first stone. And then everybody said, and then Jesus said, sin no more to the prostitute. And I said, yeah, it was Jesus that said it. It was not us. Our yeah. job is not to condemn. Right. It's just not our job. And I don't even know that it was Jesus's job to condemn. Mm. He was saying what any parent would say. Yes. Stop doing what you're doing. It's no good for you. Right. No one would encourage their kid, their child to be a prostitute. Right. Nobody. But they love them unconditionally. And that's what Jesus did. And, and, and But he did not encourage us to condemn each other. There's no place on the Bible for no. condemnation. That, that's a people. human condition, isn't it? No, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself does not have an asterisk. Okay. Does not say love thy neighbor as thyself, except if they're a prostitute or they're right. a Muslim or they're an yeah. atheist. Yeah, yeah. It's rubbish. Yeah. You know, you know, where you talked at the beginning, and and I've seen the 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 promo to the video. You know, uh, the movie division right now is at an all time high, but I also think when you look at this and that, the opposites, and both of them look at each other and go, well, hang on. You know, we've got a huge crevice between us. And it's like, how is this helping Earth? How is this helping each other? And I'm a true colors coach, so there's always different perspectives. And a brilliant book, which I'm sure you, you have come across, is Who Moved My Cheese by Spencer Johnson, MD. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, four key personalities with different approach to things. And you've got to, you've got to understand your personality trait. What is your approach? Right? Because it's who you are. It's, it's the human DNA of you, of who you are. And so if one person says, oh, you've got to do this, I did this. Yes, it may have worked for you, but he, he may, or another person may need to pivot and go down a different road. Mm -hmm. Encourage them on their own road. Don't demand they take your road. Because right. when they fail on your road, they go back to, you know, the beginning again, feeling this is not going to work, I'm worthless. But if you encourage them in their own light to be their own light on their own road, now they can shine bright. No doubt, no doubt. You know what I also like to encourage people in the in the march of history. And I'm I'm a I, I all my life I've been reading about history. Do you know there was very little time for us to ponder any of these things right up until the 20th century. Mm -hmm. We worked. There was yes. war continually. You know, 60 million people died in World War II alone. 60 million. You want to talk about division? The U.S. Civil War, which I've just been doing some storytelling about. You want to talk about division? 670 thousand people were butchered on our soil and there was slavery. Look, we are marching towards this arc of divinity and a, a divine spark of freedom for people in half of the world. The world is so much better 
and materially better, spiritually better, in every way better than it was 20 years ago. Yeah. Stephen Pinker, a great secular humanist, has been writing about this, that it's the media selling the misery. Yes, the yes. media selling the division. Yeah. It's nonsense. It's, yeah, well, okay, you vote Republican and I vote Democrat. That's fine. That's good. That's healthy. But how do we now have bread? How do we break right. bread? Because you don't want, you, look, conflict's not evil. Conflict's actually good. Conflict of personalities. But how do we navigate that conflict? Yeah. Where's the how conversation do, in it? Yeah. Yeah. Please spare me the world without conflict. This will be the worst world in the world. But what kind of conflict? Is it bayonets and stabbing mm -hmm. each other over every division? No, Europe knew nothing but war and battle lines for centuries. There hasn't been a war since night, a real one. I mean, there was a Cold War. You know, the, the Russians came in and took Hungary. Let's not forget it. They confiscated a country, right? That's not happening as much anymore. And right. where it is, it's such a tragic thing, right? Um, because you don't have a chance. The, div the divine gets suppressed by totalitarians. It mm. gets suppressed. So never before have we been more free to pursue the divine, to pursue without interference from malevolent bad actors, more often than not the government itself, yeah. right? The dictatorships, the gangs and thugs of Africa, the tribes yes. in my Middle East. It was tribal, the Middle East. My family couldn't wait to get away from the Middle East. Mm. Because everything was Capulets and Montagues. That guy did to our family, the Sunnis and the Shia, the Protestants and the Catholics. Look, people have been fighting in every religion, in every place in the world, in ways that are unimaginable until the 21st century. This has been the century with the least amount of death in war than any in world history. We've got to remember, again, 20 million, just 60 million, just in World War II. Six years, 60 million deaths. You've got to wrap your, round, your head around the idea that a great country like Germany could gas, we could yes. gas 11 million people. And what would that do for your spark of the divine? You'd mm. be saying, God, whoever you are, you don't exist, mm. right? There is no divinity. This is baseness. It's horror. We have been spared this horror more in our lifetimes than any other generation in world history. And that gratitude for that yeah. also comes from not just self-knowledge, but knowledge of the world helps too. Because then you can walk into your space of gratitude going, I didn't in deserve this inheritance of my ability to vote, my ability yeah. to speak freely, my ability to own property and have, make sure that no government can come in and steal it from me for its own purposes, the way the Nazis stole not right. just the Jews' property, they stole their teeth. They stole the gold filling in their teeth. This is the depravity of man. Yeah. And, oh, and how we fought that war, America and Australia and Canada, and, and then we, we didn't ask for land, we didn't take yeah. France, and we let France be France again, and we sent aid. This is, this is also your country at its best, right? Right. We, we have to remember that, that, that there's a lot of beauty and good that's been happening over the centuries. And again, we did nothing to, 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 in, to deserve these inheritances. And we need to preserve them. And that divine spark is how we do it. And we should be so grateful that in our country and so many free countries, you get to do this right now in China. If you're chasing the divine spark, be careful. Yeah. Because you'll go to a prison camp and get re-educated because there's only one divine spark and it's the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so pursuing these things comes at grave threat in some places in this world. And the joy here is that no matter what your religion, no matter what your path in this country, in Canada, in Europe, in, 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 in much of the world, 50 to 60% of the world now has these kinds of freedoms. And if you would have told anybody in the 19th century that people could pick their elected representatives, that they could pick their church or no church at all, that there'd be separation of church and state or mosque and state or, 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 or any kind of separation so that people could live peaceably together. With all these different religions thrown together in ethnicities and we're not stabbing each other and going to war every month. Mm -hmm. So this gives us the space to pursue the divine. How right. lucky are we? How yeah. lucky are we? Yeah, there's that inspiration, that invitation. But the other thing is, you know, social media has its negativity as as anything, any instrument does. You know, a car can kill too. Um, it's how we drive it. Um, yep. But also social media is a great one of bringing 
accountability. This is wrong. What are we going to do? How are we going to come together? How are we going to support? You know, George yeah. Freud was, was the huge catalyst there. Um, and it is only when we come together, and I'm not talking about pitchforks, it's coming together in love, in peace. Now, very often met with violence, but still stand in your peace. And I know the hardest thing to do is to stand in your peace when you're facing violence. But that peace is your core truth and let no one take that from you. Now, I don't mm -hmm. mean you don't defend yourself, but what I'm saying is don't rise up to the violence. That's mm -hmm. the last resort. And it, we can change things. Look at the changes that have happened already. Look at the changes that are happening. Well, why are they happening? Because we stood up together and said no more. We yeah, stood up and said we can't take Martin Luther King did, right? He, he followed the edicts of two great men in his life, one named Gandhi and one named Jesus. Yeah. He put these two together and he said, we are, A, we're going to judge a man by the content of his character, not the color of his skin. Right. Moreover, he said, we're going to do this nonviolently. Yes. And if they stick the dogs on us, we're going to go to jail. And while, they, while he was in jail, he wrote letters from a Birmingham jail. And it may, have, it may be the most beautiful letter ever written in the history of the United States. There is always a reason for something. There is always a solution. And there is always an inspiration to share. What are we here for? We're here to learn. We're here to rise up. We're here to stand up together. We're here to be equal and to embrace all our wonderful differences. Imagine if all we ever ate was just meat and potatoes, <laughs> right? And we didn't have this wonderful smokersboard of beautiful foods around the world. Well, those are all those lovely cultures coming together from people of different color and different backgrounds. And isn't it wonderful when we put everything together and share each other's culture and wonderment and excitement and exploration instead of the damning each other? It is, and one of the things that I worry about in my country and a lot of the West is as we talk about equality, we have to be very careful. The other question I asked these young people after we were done is, you have two children. One does all of his homework. He does all of his work. He, he's obedient. The other child wrecks the house, mm -hmm. has pot parties when you're gone at the age of 12. And do you give them the same allowance? Not one kid raised his hand and said, yes. I said, you created an equality in your own house. Mm -hmm. Is that good or bad? Look, we need to get equality of outcomes. Yes. It, it, the desire to get equality of outcomes is a dangerous game. Equality of opportunity. If I want to be a teacher like my dad was, my dad didn't covet what the surgeon had because the surgeon spent 20 years of his life sacrificing to have a position that he got paid a lot more money than my dad. My dad once never coveted for that surgeon's life. Right. He never coveted once for that surgeon's money. And he never once said that surgeon's getting paid 500,000 and I'm getting paid 80 and that's not fair. My dad thought that was very fair. Yeah. So we have to be careful about yeah. using these words like equity and equality as if there's something wrong with an NFL athlete getting paid X or a great singer being at X, and me who can't hold the tune getting paid nothing. Right. That's whole life. In the same yes. way that if your son has a very successful restaurant and the guy next to him has bad food and doesn't work, that guy doesn't deserve your son's money. That is injustice. Yeah. That's not justice. So as we're talking about social justice, let's be careful to not make it anti-social justice. Right. All right. Coveting, agree. coveting is a tumor. Yes. Coveting is awful. And we're creating a bunch of young people who don't even understand how wealth gets created. And I'm not talking just money wealth, because I know a lot of people have money wealth at the expense of spiritual wealth. Oh, they're totally poor. Poor of heart. Yeah. CEO. And so don't hammer that CEO. Try to understand how hard it is to be responsible for 2,000 employees. What, how many international trips you have to take and how many things you give up, right? And you want good CEOs. And if you want to keep them, you better pay them slightly more than the guy who's cleaning the floors. This is really important stuff. And this is why I came to this country. My, you know, the, 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 the dictator Mussolini took my father's, my grandfather's factory. He stole it and he actually politicized it. He said, the rich are soaking the poor and I'm gonna make it better by taking the rich people's businesses and giving it to the poor. What do you think happened to the economy of Italy? It got destroyed all the under leaders. the name of socialism, the greater good, and of course, equality. Yep. Be careful.
about people who yeah. I want to fight. No, where, the where I want to see the equality is that the janitor is just as important in in the sense that if you walk into a building, and that building is dirty. It oh, is no uninviting. Doubt. And you no you know, why do I want to go and see this person at the CEO if, if this is the, the presentation? That janitor has set the stage. So I would like to see the CEO and the janitor have those conversations, have that respect, have that acknowledgement of each other's position. Because as you said, you know, the, the conductor of the orchestra is exceptionally point because they, they hold everyone together. Uh, your soloist has worked hard to get to be that soloist, but the no triangle doubt. is is equally as important to that collective piece of music. And it's everybody oh, knowing. Not. Be proud in your contribution. Don't compare. And, and but imagine respect, this. respect treated, the value. If your son treated the waiters and the waitresses poorly, right? Yes. This would not be a good way to maintain staff. A good businessmen no. do this all the time. The bad ones don't, but the good ones respect their staff. They routinely want to make, maintain their, their people and, and retain them. Because, yes. hey, let's face it, people will go somewhere else yes. and get treated better. Again, this is the joy of freedom, right? Mm -hmm. If we didn't have the freedom to move to places, this forces people to either treat their people right or else. And the freedom of that janitor to move to another place where he gets right. treated better. Or we look, we've told stories of janitors who end up running their own janitorial services. Exactly. So there's dignity in all yeah. work. Yes. I'm just talking about this idea, as my dad always told me, we're not going to look at the car dealer who has sacrificed 20 years, risked his capital, employs 250 people, and, and goes through bad times when he doesn't get paid, and good times when he gets paid a lot more, to push him through the times when he doesn't make more, yeah. and may not have empathy for him. This idea of attacking people of wealth is as ugly as attacking people of poverty. Right. How do we create a more equitable country without vilifying each other? And right. I've never won, as I was a middle-class kid, I never looked at the rich as evil. If they got, if they ran 10 great restaurants, they got wealthy because they created great services. Look at how many people are employed and how many people going away with happy tummies. You know, it's, exactly. it's that ripple effect. You know, the accountability of being a rich person and being that big CEO is, are you doing it at the cost of other people? That's right. Right. Then no. Are you hoarding all of your money and not replanting it? You know, and how well do you think that works out for company? You know what? You know, I've told people to say, look at the Fortune 500 in America. Do you know it replaces itself practically entirely? Do you know that Google Google was formed by two immigrants 15 years ago? Microsoft didn't get there first. IBM didn't get there no. first. They were so big they couldn't get there because they were protecting their own interests. Look, what I love about freedom is and 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 this challenge of, of business is that a lot of these big businesses end up dying because they're big. They can't pivot. Yes. They have no yes. resilience. They yes. can't change when the world and the markets change or the tastes of the people change. This is all good for the people. And I could, I could name you companies and you go, I've never heard of that company. And then the top 10 companies. And also think about the richest people in America right now. Elon Musk, first generation immigrant. Um, look, you can go down the line. None of these guys came here with money. They came here with a good idea. And all their money is in their stock. They're, it's all in their stock. They're barely paying themselves. And any one of us can own a stock or a share of Tesla or Apple or Google. And if these shares go down, these guys used to have money, had money, and now it'll be these guys used to have money. Because yeah. that's really how free enterprise works. And I just wish people had a deeper understanding of like when Henry Ford did what he did. And you want to talk about light. This guy took the manufacturing of cars and before Ford started, only the wealthiest people right. could have this kind of transportation. And when Ford was done, the cars were 10 times cheaper. So the middle class could own cars and they were 10 times better. Wow. Yes. Better and cheaper. Yeah. And it changed the world. People who did not want to live on the farm anymore had an alternative. Right. This is wonderful, right? Yes. And, oh, no Opportunity. Government. Opportunity. No There's always possibilities. Can, yeah. Always. But yeah. remember this. No government can bring down the price of car by 10x. And no government, the in, no government has the incentive to work that hard and risk their life to create that kind of freedom. And I always want people to remember, and it's interesting how these guys talk, because they don't talk about the government and they don't talk about systemic this or systemic that. They have to look in a mirror yeah. and look at their choices, right? Yes. And, and stop blaming society, their daddy, their mommy. These are all true things, right? But they don't change the fact that they're the guys who shot a guy. Right. They're the guys who did these things and they're the guys that have to undo it right. and then improve themselves. And when they get to that granular level 
of not looking at the macro of society, but looking at their own life. If we could all just improve our lives as fathers, if we could all yeah. be better business owners, yep. better fathers, better yep. workers, the world would be a better place. Yes. Oh, it is up to each and every one of us. Now, yes, your upbringing is going to be a part of your patterning. It's going to be a part of your understanding, your knowledge, and you're going to work from that basis. But if we're always willing to learn, to pivot, I don't like this lesson I'm learning here. It, it doesn't fit me. So what lesson am I going to learn elsewhere? Right. right? So what we aren't being sold is the fact that we do have the choice that it does lie within us and that when we, we do align with, with our own divine and we open up our heart, we're guided to better choices because we're not as humans, we're humanoids. We don't think straight, but when mm -hmm. we allow the di a divine through, it guides us, it lights us, it shows us our way. Uh, but if, if something doesn't fit, I mean, we, we bash fathers, but we look at them and go, well, what did they go through? That's and, right. and, and, you know, what did they, you know, they're, they're a subject of the way they were brought up. It's all they knew. The real question here is here is that if you know it's wrong, or if you know you're unhappy, if you do not feel connected, what are you doing about it to change your own narrative? This is, I think, the lesson of our movie. Mm -hmm. These three guys own it. They change their narrative remarkably. They lead productive lives as citizens. And look, God's going to call some people to be CEOs, the divine, yeah. and yes. others concert pianists and others to own restaurants right. do your thing don't compare yourselves Please, to others because i'm promising you i've known ceos that the pressure is so hard on them yeah. that, that, that there are times they've contemplated suicide yeah, mm -hmm. it's that hard it's a yeah. burden so don't look at a person driving down the street with a nice car and a nice house and think they have it better than you because it's nonsense you don't know that person you don't understand that person in fact sit down and have lunch with that person yeah. but the only person you have control over and the only person that matters is you and your immediate community and how you're serving that community and how you're serving yourself and your own purpose. That's the purpose of our movie in the end is these three men radically changed their lives. And it's easy to get this movie. And um, it's uh, it's available now uh, for folks to watch these three guys. Test it's basically three guys stories raw in the rawest form possible. We get out of the way completely and we only hear from them. There's not even a narrator in our movie. Mm -hmm. There's not a need. These guys' stories are so clear. They're so from the heart and you'll love the way they take responsibility for their lives and the way they forgive the people in their lives, right. uh, which is, which is a, it's such a beautiful thing. And then and it, their, their whole life changes because they took responsibility yes. and then they found the divine spark and purpose in their life. And then they went ahead and pursued that purpose. What a crazy idea. And it's available to everybody now. It right. used to be back in the 19th century, you spent 90% of your time finding food and storing it. That's it. That was your life. There were no 401ks. There was no cable. There were, you know, you went to a church and you pretty much only had one choice because that's the church your family grew up right. with. You were going to just do what you did. So just remember how, how fortunate we are to grow up in the 21st <sighs> century with all of these opportunities, all of these choices, and we are one YouTube click away from hearing this conversation. Right. And back in the day, you could have never heard this conversation on it unless it happened in your backyard. Right. So I mean, you know, now the world is open. Anybody in the world can hear this and That's share right. this because this is a story that is around the world. That's and the right. more people that do see it, the more people that talk about it, the more people that go, well, I, we've got to be part of the solution in some way. And we've got to make better choices. So, you know, a father who's kind of lost himself is watching this and going, my God, I don't want that impact on my son or That's my daughter. Right. You know, what can I do? And also to understand there is help. All you have to do is ask. And right. it is not weakness to ask. It is strength. And being vulnerable is okay. It is not a weakness. It's a strength. And be open to these different faith traditions yes. and different pathways. Yeah. Because one of them's for you. Mm -hmm. One of there, there are about five or six big ones, right? And there are a bunch of smaller ones too. And there are combinations of them. But really seek, seek, be open-minded about them because you may be surprised uh, at at what the opportunities are. And don't judge them. Try them. Right. Try them. Uh, until we're willing to explore, where we'll never discover. This right. Is, a dead, a dead truth, a dead truth. So, uh, so the I, site... I, I, can't, I can't tell you how, how much I appreciate, you know, the time. 
um, uh, on your program and that you're that you're covering this with us. And I just wanted to make sure your audience knows where they could find. Yes, please. Um, will you tell people how they can find it? Yes, it's called The Streets Were My Father, and you can go to SalemNow.com. That is S-A-L-E-M Now.com. And uh, it's there to stream. Um, you can buy it, rent it, um, and it's a, it, it'll move you in many ways. And play it with your family. Even if you're a good dad, play it, because your kids need to know what life looks like without a father. It'll make them more grateful. Maybe they'll start to reach out to kids in their school yeah. and maybe invite them to the house. Yeah, right? but it's also, it's also another invite for other fathers to see other fathers who are struggling. That's anyway, exactly right. You know what, let's just go for a, go for a beer, go for a coffee. It's exactly you know? Right. You know, and you know, that is all it takes is that, yeah, you're going to get people that are defensive. I don't need it. Everything is all right. right. And again, you know, just don't be persistent in a loving way, but don't be obnoxious and don't be in their no. face right mm -hmm. be invitational and you're gonna wait you know i would love you to come and chat with me because i've got a problem i'd love to share with you that's right you know put the put the it on you share something and say you know have you come across this what have you done and if it's you know the person is, is you know you've planted a seed you've yeah. planted a seed there now you can just water it with you know some love and mm -hmm. also do not um, ever misunderstand that you don't have to be in someone's presence to send them love to send them divine energy. No, no, I couldn't agree more. In our in our faith, we're praying for people continually. Yes. Um, and people who have not, and we don't pray for them to be Christians. We pray no. for them. We pray for them, and we're talking to our God uh, to intercede on their behalf. Right. Um, and that's how you show strangers love. And you're not doing this out of manipulation. You're not doing it for any gain. No. You're doing it because you love you love the person, and and want to see the divine spark sparked yes um and that's why most of us pray and most of us don't pray for ourselves and our families most of us have some very long prayer lists and half of the prayer lists are non-christians right. and it's not we hope they become christians right it's we hope they get through this cancer we hope they find yeah. peace we hope they god get them through this financial struggle etc etc ignite the heart and souls indeed, indeed. when they do it it just you know, it doesn't matter who has the struggles or what the struggles are. Again, there is no comparison because we don't know the pain you're going through. We also don't know the resilience that you have. But if we are there to help you ignite that heart and soul and step into that divine light and let you know you're not alone, that we're there for you. And we're not going to judge you on your past. We're going to see you in your now, who you are now. And even if you're somebody that's still wobbly on your legs and still trying to find your way, or even still dealing with anger and frustration, we're going to be there for you with love. We are also going to ask you to be accountable because that's part of your recovery. But we're going to be there for you with love because that's the only way we're going to heal each other or heal this planet. No doubt. And, and a great and great uh, parting words. I, I again, I deeply appreciate uh, the time on the call and uh, and I hope your audience uh, gets to see the movie and be moved by these three men's story. The beautiful thing it is, it's easy to share. Uh, family, watch it. Uh, is the, uh, do you have any friends that need to see this? Invite them over for dinner. Let's watch it together. You know, share it, share it, share it. Because when you're sharing, you're sharing the solution. And that's mm. what we're looking for, is sharing a solution. There is always an answer, always a solution, if you're willing to look and, and allow it to happen, allow it to see and allow it to be shared. So thank mm -hmm. you so much, Lee, for being here with today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a joy. Until next time, folks, remember, <laughs> do not throw people out with the bathwater. Be there to give them a nice, clean shower of love, and you will see the difference. Until next time, bye for now. We hope that you enjoyed the show. You will hear many, many shows here at softdiscoverymedia.com. We have new shows for you out every week. Just find them on our podcast or, or what's new. If you feel that you have something to share that makes a difference in the lives of others, or you too feel that you could be a host, please contact me at info at selfdiscoverymedia.com and we will be glad to speak with you. Have a wonderful day.